All right, class, here we are with our discussion on the history of philosophy. Once again, um, I'm really excited about this particular lecture because I love Aristotle. <laughs> um, we're going to see a lot of the contribution of, it, of Aristotle. Again, a lot of this is going to be roughshod because so much will be uh, covered in your text and, and whatnot. And again, this is just a very long um, spectrum of ideas that we're trying to uh, go over here. Uh, but hopefully what I'm going to try to do is pull out some of these super important uh, aspects of, of Arist Aristotle, Aristotelianism, we could even say, um, some of the aspects of his philosophy here. Now, I do also have a, uh, what's going on with this? This isn't good. This isn't good here. Okay, now. I'm starting to get a little worried there. So, like I said, we're here with Aristotle. Um, and what we're going to start to do is pull some of this stuff out. So, sorry, that broke my <laughs> train of thought there when our slides weren't working. Now, let's go ahead and launch into this. Now, Aristotle, as we talked about before, was the disciple of Plato, who was the disciple of Socrates. And, of course, I don't mean, obviously, uh, in any sort of religious context. I simply mean uh, in the sense that he was his mentor, right? His uh, academic mentor in that sense. Now, just like Plato has his own offering of thought, right? Even though he's mentored by Socrates, we see this with Aristotle. Now, Aristotle is going to break very heavily um, with Plato in this idea of the forms, the world the ideas, uh, the world of the forms, I should say, um, and just how they exist. But he's going to stay with, and I briefly mentioned this um, towards the end of the last lecture, he's going to stay with his mentor in that he thinks these exist. Um, and we're going to see how this is going to be a super important contribution to philosophy. And I would even, I would even say to knowledge in general. Um, I'm not going to disagree with uh, Aristotle here. Um, neither is, is a later thing here we're going to look at Thomas Aquinas. Um, but before we get to that, as we know, Plato founded the Academy, right? Um, which is even even to those known that aren't necessarily uh, uh, fluent or familiar with philosophy, many people know that Plato formed the Academy, right? Well, Aristotle, there's all sorts of background information that we could go to in this, why Aristotle uh, didn't continue with the Academy. A lot of people thought that uh, or, or seem to seem to think seem to teach that Aristotle thought that he would inherit, in some sense, inherit in some sense the uh, the, the the academy from Plato upon upon Plato's death or uh, a retirement. How we want to look at the word retirement in ancient Greece, right? But nevertheless, when Plato was finished, right, when he was um, completed with his teaching um, at the academy. Um, there seems to be some argument that Aristotle thought that he would receive this. And of course he did, right? It, it went to this other dude, <laughs> uh, to use an ancient Greek philosophical term, dude. <laughs> now, Aristotle travels away. He leaves for quite some period of time, I think around 12 years or so, somewhere a decade, give or take a few years, uh, travels around, uh, mentors Alexander the Great, as I have mentioned here in the slides, um, so that's just kind of a neat historical side note is that Aristotle was the tutor of Alexander the Great. Um, but upon Aristotle's return, he's not actually a citizen of Athens, but when he gets back to Athens, he founds what's called the Lyceum, right? Um, so you may have heard of that. You may not have. Um, but if you have heard of the Lyceum, this is where it comes from. It's just as the Academy was um, Plato's school, right? The, the Lyceum was... Uh, where Aristotle does his teaching and founds the Lyceum. Now, he's also called sometimes the Peripatic teacher. Um, and I'm, I never pronounce that correctly. I, I'll say it one way one time, say it a different way the other time. But essentially what that means is walking around. Uh, you, know, uh, you can see the Greek root, uh, root word there. But it's, so some would say that Aristotle, he's called the Peripatic teacher because he walks around while he's teaching. Some would say it's because of the, the colonnades, uh, the walkway area of where they were in Athens, where uh, where he was doing his teaching. Needless to say, it's kind of a neat thing. Um, and just as a side note, it seems that we do have a lot of our, our best conversations, deep conversations while we're on walks, right? While we're just talking and walking and 
um, with others. Um, maybe you're even doing that now in some sense. Maybe you're listening to this lecture as you're uh, going for a walk or doing your exercise or whatever else. Needless to say, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, these are just some kind of interesting background uh, features about Aristotle. Um, I know I don't have this in the notes, but it's just worth mentioning that we really don't have any writings of Aristotle himself, like Plato, I mean, uh, like Socrates. Um, what we have of his writings are, are generally thought to be notes um, taken from his students. And in fact, a, a lot of people would say this is why his writings are so difficult, um, because they weren't necessarily meant to be a volume that Aristotle just sat down and wrote out, but that they were originally just notes, uh, abbreviations of thought uh, that were taken down by students. Um, and I can attest to uh, the clarity of, of Aristotle's thought, but at the same time, uh, sometimes just the, the, the difficulty in trying to sit, sit down and read through, uh, say like the Organon or uh, Nicomachean Ethics, something like that. Sometimes they do just seem way out there. Um, but it does, that seems to make sense of it when we say, well, wait a minute, maybe these are actually notes. Now, what we're going to talk about uh, also is his influence on various disciplines, um, logical principles. Uh, I'll put logic principles there. That sounds terrible. I, should have, I, didn't, I didn't catch that. Hopefully, uh, by the time I give you guys these notes, these, this uh, PDF uh, uh, slides, I'll have fixed that to logical principles as opposed to logic principles. Uh, but anyway, so his inf inf uh, influence on various disciplines, like his pr the principles of logic, um, the informal fallacies. Uh, we're also going to see how his logic is related. In fact, sometimes it's called Aristotelian logic, um, which was dominant up until roughly the time of Bertrand Russell, uh, the 20th century. Uh, but Aristotelian logic is, is heavily influenced by his metaphysic. Um, and when we talk about metaphysic, right, his metaphysic, we're talking about metaphysics. Uh, again, if you're familiar with the history of philosophy or just philosophy in general, you know that when we say something like metaphysics, we're not talking about the goofy section at the Borders bookstore, right? Where you're talking about ice crystals and uh, tarot cards and all that nonsense, right? We're talking about reality. Um, just what does it mean to say what exists, right? So sometimes the, the modern uh, uh, term for this study is ontology, right? Thing that Kant introduces that term, if I'm not mistaken, but essentially it's the same thing. Metaphysics or ontology, what is ontos, right? What is real? What actually exists, right? Um, we're going to see form and matter. We're going to see where he parts with Plato here. Um, and also, again, you're going to see how so much of Aristotelian thought is centered around uh, what Aristotle considers to be reality. So as I note here on the slide, his ethic is going to be related to that. Um, his metaphysic uh, is going to be related to his ethic, right? We're also going to see a couple arguments, uh, probably not a couple, probably just one in particular, uh, but Aristotle is, is, is uh, known uh, even within the philosophy of religion. If you've taken that course with me, we talk about Aristotle's argument for the existence of God. Um, but even those that don't necessarily know much about Aristotle do know his contribution to, say, arguments for the existence of God. So let's go ahead and look at these. Oh, and also I want to say too, I'm going to pull up a video later. It's the context of the video is uh, I'm at a uh, college campus here, uh, University of West Georgia, and I'm giving a, a, a discussion on a, 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 a um, argument for God's existence. Um, but I'll talk about the four calls. So I'm going to pull that video up a little bit in a minute or two to uh, introduce that, that concept of the four causes in the context of that argument. Now, as I said, he's the founder of the Lyceum. Uh, he was the uh, tutor of Alexander the Great. Again, that's just a cool historical side note, uh, parabatic teacher. So we kind of, we've already discussed essentially uh, this first slide here um, and how that gives a little bit of background to this figure of Aristotle uh, who lived, you know, roughly 330 years BC uh, in that era. Now, what I want us to realize is that Aristotle, and I don't have this in the slide here, but Aristotle is often called uh, the philosopher of common sense. And again, I mentioned this last lecture, um, that, that this is often a title given to him at the conclusion of last lecture. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to uh, Aristotelian uh, thought and philosophy, just as a personal 
me as, as personally speaking, one that's interested in philosophy. Um, and again, we're going to see this uh, recapitulated, um, nuanced even more by Thomas Aquinas later. But Aristotle is essentially one of the philosophers, if not the preeminent philosopher, that when you come to the table, right, when you come into the Lyceum, if we put it that way, when you come into the classroom, Aristotle is not going to treat you as if you just don't know anything at all, right? He thinks that you're actually bringing some knowledge uh, uh, to the game here, so to speak, to the discussion. So uh, philosopher of Notre Dame, uh, Ralph McInerney, famously says that um, the only people that treat you as if you don't know anything at all, that you come to the table not having any knowledge, are modern philosophers and used car salesmen. Right now, that's not a, a, a slight to any of you guys that may sell uh, used cars. That's just going to go with a cultural uh, uh, stereotype of used car salesman. But Aristotle stands in contrast to that. Aristotle thinks that when you come to the discussion, you actually know a good deal, right? A good deal of stuff, right? A good amount of it. He's saying, you know, your noetic structure is actually there's something there, right? That you're not just coming as a moron, so to speak. Now, that's not to say uh, that you don't need to learn, right? That we don't need to learn things. It's not to say that everything that we hold to be, take as common sense actually is true. He's just saying that there's a lot to be said for uh, what we think we know. Um, and he thinks that we actually do know a lot of these things. And so his, his, his concentration is he wants to figure out how we know these. And are these things permissible? Um, are they justified um, in knowing these things? Are we justified in knowing these things? Is there, are, are there good reasons to think that outside of some defeater? Now, that sounds a lot like uh, Alvin Plantinga, right? But really, this predates even Plantinga. Um, uh, Plantinga would say that we have something like he, he argues for this reformed epistemology, right? That we have these basic uh, beliefs, right? And they're, and they're justified and whatnot. Aristotle, that's, there's going to be some similarities there. Um, that there are basic beliefs that we do hold. Um, uh, I've got this ready for the pause button in case when my young and runs, a, <laughs> runs in there. Um, so he's going to say that we do have these basic beliefs, but it's going to be different than reformed epistemology. If you have any uh, uh, background in philosophy already, then some of this will sound a, a, a bit similar, uh, this reformed epistemology and Aristotle's common sense approach to philosophy, but they're not the same. Um, now, if you don't have any uh, background, don't worry about it. You can toss all that out. You don't need to know that right now. Now, keep going here. Let's go to ne our next slide. Again, I'm just going to pull, keep this pulled up. Now, when he when we talk about the influence on various disciplines, um, again, some of you that are apologetics junkies, um, you may already be heavily familiar with some of the first principles of logic, um, but you may not necessarily know that Aristotle. Now, these these first principles are obviously around in a philosophical discussion before Aristotle, prior to Aristotle. But Aristotle is really going to be the guy that really helps to clarify these, pull them out in, into the open. Um, uh, and help to make a lot of sense of this uh, to people that aren't necessarily familiar uh, with these these principles of logic. Now, I just want to go over some of these again. You're probably again, if you're apologetics junkie, you're, you've really got this already. But if you're just if you're new, if you're coming into this thing, then right, I want you to understand as well. So these these principles here, and here they are on the slide: this law of non-contradiction, law of excluded excluded middle, and law of identity, are really foundational um, to uh, logic. Right? Logic is just built around these principles. Now, as we're going to see, these the, these principles. Uh, are not just logical principles, strictly speaking, in Aristotle's view, and I would say which is the correct view, but they're also metaphysical principles. They're not just uh, arbitrary rules of logic, but they're just laws. They're just principles that are in uh, that are applicable to reality right here and now and always. Right. So the law of non-contradiction is just simply to say that. Let's say let's state it this way first. It just simply says that A is not not A. Right. So if we were to write this out, it's just A is not equal to negative A, right, or not A, um, meaning that it, something can't be true at the same time in the same way in the same sense. Right. It can't be raining and not raining at the same time in the same way in the same sense. Right. Um, it is either raining or not or, or not raining. Right. Now, 
again, some of you may say, well, it could be raining here and rain and not raining in Japan, right? But that's not the claim. The claim is not that it's raining here, but not raining in Japan. The claim is it can't be raining here and not raining here at the same time in the same sense. That's just what we mean by contradiction, right? Now, you heard me say that that's a principle um, of logic, but notice that's a principle of being or a metaphysical principle. Because when I say that it's either raining in this room right here, right here, right here, right now, or, and, or it's not raining right here, right now, it can't be both at the same time in the same way in the same sense. That, I'm not just talking about a proposition. I'm talking about reality, right? I'm talking about whether or not it's raining in here, right? Which is something that's happening external to my, whatever's going on in my head. That's just, I'm, there's a statement about reality. Sure, it's a proposition, but it's pointing over and above itself as a proposition. It's a statement about reality. Right. So the law of non-contradiction is not just a um, law of logic uh, or it doesn't just apply just to logic. It applies to reality. Right. Either you're, you, for instance, you can't be listening to this this lecture and not listening to this lecture at the same time, same way, in the same sense. Um, law of excluded middle is you're either listening to this lecture or not listening to this lecture. Right. So you're going to see how. These principles, law of, law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, law of identity, um, it's kind of like looking at a diamond, right? Um, they're all in one way the same thing, but you're different look, looking at the, this, this, these, these principles, almost this one type of principle from different angles, right? So the law of excluded middle is, is either raining or not raining, right? Now, you may think, well, no, isn't that what you just said? No, law of non-contradiction is it can't be true at the same time that it's, it's you know, raining or not raining. If it's raining, then it's not raining. If it's not raining, then it's raining, right? It's a contradiction. The law of excluded middle says roughly the same thing, but from, again, a different angle. It's either raining or it's not raining. There's no middle ground there. So, for instance, um, another example might be, let's look at God's existence. Uh, the law of non-contradiction says it can't be true at the same time in the same way, in the same sense, that God exists and God doesn't exist, right? Because if God exists then it can't be true that God doesn't exist. But if it's true that God doesn't exist, then it can't be true that God does exist, right? Um, the law of excluded middle, saying the same thing, but from that different angle, is saying that either God exists or God doesn't exist. There's no middle ground. You can't have, it can't be, um, well, God kind of exists or God kind of doesn't. No, either God exists or God doesn't exist. There's no middle ground. Um, now, the law of identity is that when we're talking about God existing, we're talking about God existing, right? When the law of identity is that that which you're talking about, A is A, right? So again, to go back through these, if we were talking about uh, like an equation type uh, glance at this, law of non-contradiction, A is not not A, right? Law of excluded middle is either A or not A, right? Um, and the law of identity is A is A, right? A is equal to A, right? A is equal to A, right? It's just saying that A is A, right? God is God, meaning that when you're talking about God, you're not talking about a tomato, right? You're not talking about a rutabaga, you know, you're not talking about a uh, whatever else. You're talking about God. Otherwise, again, if these aren't applicable in logic, then if the law of identity is not applicable in logic, if it's not just applicable in logic, but in reality, then communication, knowledge, uh, in, rational inquiry is completely impossible. Because if when I say God, I don't mean God, then how can I make any sort of move uh, in, an, in an advance of knowledge, right? I'm not going anywhere in knowledge if what I'm talking about is not what I'm talking about, right? And if contradictions can be true at the same time, in the same way, in the same sense, then, I, then any claim that I make can mean the exact opposite. So again, how can I make any advance in knowledge? Same with law that's good middle. Now, the point simply is that you can't, now listen, this is gonna be, this may be new to some of you. You can't prove any of these principles. And the point is, is that Aristotle would say that these are self-evident principles, meaning that you can't prove them because any demonstration of them, and when we say demonstration in philosophy, that means a proof. Any demonstration of them, any proof of them, has to assume them. You you, you can't say, uh, I'm going to prove to you the law of non-contradiction, because that very statement is applying, right, is assuming that the law of non-contradiction is at work and at play right now. Because, again, you don't mean, when you say, 
I'm going to prove to you the law of non-contradiction. You don't mean I'm not going to prove to you the law of non-contradiction, right? So when you made the statement, you're already assuming it. But if you're already assuming it, then you can't prove it because any proof is going to assume it in the demonstration of it, right? Now, here's the cool thing. Some would say, oh, no, if we can't prove them, then how can we know them? Because, again, remember, think about it. Any disproof, if you try to disprove the laws of logic, these first principles, if you try to disprove the law of non-contradiction, then you're going to use it. <laughs> you're going to assume it. So this is what Aristotle means to, when he says something is self-evident. If I were to say that I do not believe the law of non-contradiction, I don't mean that I believe it, right? No, if I say I do not believe the law of non-contradiction, then the law of non-contradiction is at work right then. I'm assuming right then that the law of non-contradiction is in play. Because when I say I don't believe the law of non-contradiction, I'm not saying that I believe the law of non-contradiction, right? So anytime I try to prove it, I'm actually having to use the law of non-contradiction. Notice, too, that when the law of identity is at play. When I say the law of non-contradiction, I'm not talking about the chair over here, right? I'm talking about the law of non-contradiction. If I'm talking, and also the law of excluded middles at play. When I say uh, either I believe the law of non-contradiction or I don't believe the law of non-contradiction, right? They're all at play. They're all right here. Now, again, tying this back to Aristotle, Aristotle is the guy who really pulls this out and expands upon this um, and really helps to make this clear in his discussion in logic, right? His, his discussion on logic is, is in his work uh, called the Organon, um, which we get the word organ, right? Which is just means tool, right? Logic is the tool to which we do all other things. So Aristotle would argue that, you know, logic is one of these disciplines that has to be studied first because any other discipline that you study, think about this again, this is just a logical thought here, is that any other discipline you study is going to assume logic, right? Because logic is just the tool, right? The book, the organ on logic is the tool by which we evaluate and study any and all other disciplines, right? This is why philosophy is, is so important because it undergirds any and all other disciplines, right? You can talk about education all day long, but what's your philosophy of education, right? Um, you can talk about education all day long, but if you're not talking about education, law of identity, um, if you're, you're either talking about education or not talking about education, right? Law of it's to the middle. Um, you're, uh, you're, you can't be talking about education and not talking about education, right? Law of non-contradiction. See, logic just applies to all these sort of things, right? So again, remember, these aren't just, when you get in discussions with so many people, they may they may want to say something like, well, logic is just uh, intellectual exercise. It doesn't necessarily apply to reality, right? Just then they apply logic to reality, right? They just use the law of non-contradiction. It applied to reality. They were making a statement about reality, saying logic doesn't apply about reality, right? These aren't just principles about rational inquiry. These are principles um, that reflect the real, right? Uh, and again, this is a lot. This is head, heavily related to his metaphysic. So let's talk about that, right? What is reality? His metaphysic. Um, first, let's, say, let's discuss this word metaphysic. So again, get the stuff, the borders book section out of your head right now. Metaphysic simply is, is, is to mean over, right? Above the physics, right? So Aristotle had what he talked about the physics, right? Like what, what exists in the physical realm and whatnot, physics. <laughs> um, and some would say that this, this, uh, this work about metaphysics was titled thusly because it just came after uh, the physics, right? Metaphysics over or after the physics. It was just put on the shelf that way, right? But most argue that he's talking about after as in like you talk about whatever's here, right? Whatever we see that exists. And then can we derive or come to any conclusions about what else may exist based simply upon what we can uh, see by observation and whatnot? What exists over and above, right? Meta, what exists over and above the physical, um, and this is metaphysics, right? This is, again, the study of reality um, as reality, the study of being, qua being, right? The study of being for as being, right? Now, clearly, well, then Aristotle's description of reality, what he thinks exists, is going to be physical stuff, right? We, you know, it's uh, there. Now, again, this is philosophy. There actually are people that don't believe that the physical, uh, uh, exist. They're called idealists, right? Um, uh, extreme realists in some sense. Now, but Aristotle's not that guy. Again, remember the philosopher 
a philosophy of common sense. Now he's going to say, just like most people agree that the physical realm exists, right? Now the, 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 the uh, controversy in our day is whether or not the physical realm is the only thing that exists, right? But needless to say, all of us, whether you're a theist, whether you're whatever you are, most of us would agree that the physical actually does exist. However, Aristotle is going to argue, um, based upon our observation of the physical, that something else has to exist as well. And I'm not necessarily, again, I'm not necessarily talking about God yet. We're not even making that leap. We're just talking about that non-material things, right? Non-physical things must be part of the category of existent things. Um, and he's going to argue this from his, our observation of the physical things. Now, the best way to, to see this or explain this is an understanding of the four causes, right? So this is a, this is a core doctrine of Aristotelianism and even again, Thomism, um, is this doctrine of, 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 call, of, of, of the four causes. What makes something exist? Now, most of us understand when we talk about the four causes, um, Aristotle lists the first two as the efficient cause and a material cause. Now, the efficient cause, and again, these aren't controversial, no matter if you're a physicalist, right, theist or not a theist, these are the two that are completely non-controversial. In fact, this is what um, most people run around assuming, uh, mostly because of public education. We've just negated any sort of logic, uh, study of logic and philosophy. Most people try to understand everything in terms of efficient causality and material causality. So I've, I've said that a lot, right? So you're thinking, well, what are you talking about, right? What is an efficient cause or material cause? Now, I'm about to, this is where I'm about to play this video that, that goes into uh, an explanation of efficient and material causes. But just to go ahead and give you a little, little taste right now, the efficient cause, let's say, uh, I'm going to use the same example that I, I do in the video uh, where I'm on the campus, the college campus over there. And let's say that I have a red solo cup, right? Now, the efficient cause of the solo cup would be the dude or the machine or whatever that makes the solo cup, right? That's the efficient cause, right? The efficient cause of this earplug here is the machine or the guy that makes the thing. Now, the material cause matter, right? Material matter. The material causes the matter from which it's composed, right? So a red solo cup, the cause of the, the material cause of the red solo cup is the plastic or, um, hybrid or composite of, of whatever they're made of, right? Uh, the material, the matter they're made of, and whatever this thing is made of, maybe some sort of uh, metal composite, you know, in the earpiece and, and plastic and, 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 and rubber, whatever, whatever the material is, whatever the matter is that they're ma it's made of. Now, here's the key concept. Here, here's what's so big in the modern day. The mo uh, modern folk, right, modern scientific thinking has tried to relegate all causes to just the efficient and material causes. So if I were to say, what caused this? They would answer, or if I were to say, what caused the red solo cup? They would answer in terms of, oh, well, the guy that made it. What caused that? That guy right there, he just made the thing, or that machine right there just made it. Oh, well, no, not just that. Well, well, yeah, I mean, whatever the stuff's made of, that causes it too. I mean, whatever its material cause is, whatever it's the matter of it is. Now, Aristotle, this is key, man. This is, this is huge. It took me a few years to undo my way of thinking about causality here. It really, really, again, because we're just raised this way. We live in a culture that wants to deny um, and teach from a perspective that the only thing that exists is the physical. Um, so it took a long time. Now, this is going to be, you're going to understand this very easily, very quickly. You're going to understand this very easily, very quickly, but it's going to take some, quite some time to get this mode of thinking out of your head that the only thing that exists are these material causes. Um, in fact, I have this discussion with my wife a lot, um, and, and, and she's even starting to come around to see like, yes, yes, this, this modern understanding of causality, um, of this modern understanding is woefully inadequate uh, to explain um, what we experience when we talk about reality. So without any further ado, let me pull this, uh, let me pull this, uh, this video up here. It's going to take a second as I uh, adjust this. Okay, let's do this. So here we go. Check this out. This particular argument of teleological, or in the teleological argument, things have final causes. 
Again, I can hear some people almost laughing from the other end of the screen. Oh, efficient causes, material causes, final causes, those formal causes, those things have been debunked for centuries. No, they haven't. There are great arguments to believe that we still have uh, causes that are not just efficient causes or material causes. Why? Because otherwise we have no reason at all, literally. Remember, we just have to say at the end of the day, well, it just does. We have no reason at all to say if things don't have a formal or a final cause, that when you do X, that uh, Y will be a result, or vice versa. When you do A, that B will be a result of that. In fact, as Edward Fazer says, you can't even make sense of efficient and material causes unless there are such things as a final cause or an end goal to this particular uh, phenomenon that we're witnessing. Okay, very, very, very quickly. A lot of information here, but just very quickly, oversimplification, four causes. Let's take a red solo cup, for example. An efficient cause, a material cause, a formal cause, and a final cause. Now, what is the efficient cause of, the, of a red solo cup? Let's say that we see a whole line of these red solo cups in some assembly line somewhere, or you're in a, some cheap grocery store at 3 a.m. in the morning that you shouldn't be at, and you see a bunch of red solo cups. All right, what is that? What's the cause of that? Well, you have the efficient cause of that. The efficient cause would be the guy, the machines, whatever, that put that, that those solo cups together that constructed the things. That would be the official cause, or official. That would be the efficient cause, excuse me. The material cause would be what? It would just be the plastic stuff that it's made of. It would just be the material which constitutes the red solo cups sitting there. So you have an efficient cause, you have a material cause. So far, nothing controversial. Everybody agrees with that. Something brought the red solo cups into existence, a bunch of guys or machines. Uh, they were made out of something, a material cause, the plastic, whatever they're made of. Now, here's the, uh, the uh, controversial type stuff that we're getting in, into, but I think it'll make sense. And again, a lot of information, we're trying to boil it down very quickly. The formal cause of the, of the red solo cup is what? It's the blueprint or the idea or the design of what that solo cup is supposed to be like. So, for instance, if somebody's going to make the red solo cups, they don't just walk over and start just you know, willy-nilly starts moving their hands around in plastic or whatever. They have a design, they have an idea, they have a blueprint in their mind that's the formal, the form of what that, of what that red solo cup is supposed to be. So you've got the efficient cause, let's say that I'm doing, I'm, I want to make the solo cup, I'm the efficient, efficient cause of that. You've got the material cause, the plastic, have the idea or the form of a red solo cup that makes that what it is, it gives it its, its, its uh, features, so to speak. Uh, and then we would have the final cause. Now what is the final cause of the cup? What is the end goal of that cup? We could look at it in this sense in, 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 in a way of saying purpose. The final cause of that cup is what? To hold a legal beverage. That's the final cause of a red solo cup is to hold that beverage. There's a purpose to the thing. There's not just the efficient cause, the material cause. There's also a formal cause and there's a final cause to it. So we see that exemplified in, say, a red or, or a red solo cup. We see those four causes at work there. Now we could also, again, oversimplify, but let's say that I want to make a table. I want to make a table. Well, why do I want to make a table? Usually when we ask why, we're usually asking the final cause. Again, going back to the, to the teleos of that thing, we're asking the final cause. Why do I want to make a table? I want to do my homework on the table. I want to sit at the table, whatever. I'm describing, I'm giving you the answer to that question in its why, in its purpose. Well, then the other causes come into play. I am the efficient cause of it. I go make it. I find material cause of the table. I can I use wood, whatever, metal, whatever they make tables out of now. The form, the idea, the blueprint of, in my mind that brings that together to be what it is in that sense. It's whatness, what it is. And the final cause, we already mentioned, the purpose of the thing. So very quickly, a lot of information there, but that's going to give you a, a quick overview of, 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 the, of the four causes of Aristotle and Aquinas. So, in regards to the universe, in regards to people, to uh, biological life, so to speak, in regards to anything that we see, or we can know, where we see causal patterns or causal regularities, we can say, now some of these we can be confused on, that's not the argument, you can be confused on some of these, no problem, but if there are any that we can say when a is done, B will be a result. In fact, if you want to argue that we can't know that, then you've just flushed science down the toilet. Because science is concerned with what? Reproducing experiments in the laboratory doing this particular thing so that this will result. And if this does that enough, enough times, then we 
supposedly have made a leap forward in our knowledge of some particular problem, whatever it may be, the particular hypothesis that was being worked on there. You do this, this will be a result. Now again, that can only be explained if you can count on the fact that there will be that result every single time, considering all the circumstances are equal. Why? Because there's a gearing towards that end. There's a gearing towards that goal or that final cause that it's going towards. Now, Aquinas would say the argument like this. He would say, now, if an arrow is going through the air. All right, so you don't need to necessarily know um, Aquinas' argument there. <laughs> um, the point of that is just simply to, uh, that's in the context of, the reason I was going into the arguments because these, the explanation of those causes um, were, uh, they were in the context of an actual argument. But the, what I wanted you to see is this, uh, get the explanation of this material, um, or excuse me, this uh, efficient material, this formal and final cause, right? So the, for, the formal cause of anything, right, is the idea, the blueprint, the form, uh, what we're going to say in a minute, the nature, the essence of the thing, uh, the whatness of the thing. So the form, the formal cause of something is the whatness of it, right? The essence of it, the isness of the thing, right? And as I mentioned in the thing, in the uh, little demonstration there, the little lecture there, was that this is going to be true. Uh, Aristotle is going to argue, and I think he's right, is this, this is going to be true of anything that exists, not just red solo cups or tables or chairs or whatever, uh, but even more specifically and more importantly, you uh, and me, dogs, cats, um, trees. Um, remember, Plato said that everything was a reflection of the form or the idea of something, and Aristotle says that's true. Everything is, uh, these forms of these universals, right? They really do exist, but they exist in the thing itself, right? So humanness really does exist, but you, we, we, humanness exists in individual humans, not just out somewhere, right? In some third realm or some other dimension, right? The world of the forms, they don't exist there. They exist in humans in some sense, right? Now we're going to see later how Aquinas even reforms that more or refines that even more to make even more sense of that, to say that they not only exist in humans, but they exist in the mind of God in some sense. Now, really that would be an Augustinian type argument, but anyway, um, that Aristotle is going to agree with Plato that things really do exist, right? These universals, these humanness really does exist, um, but it's going to exist in the thing in and of itself. Dogs, dogness really does exist, but it's going to exist in dogs, right? And in the intellect, right? Um, it's not just going to, it's not going to exist in the world of the form somewhere. That seems almost unintelligible. Um, and then the final cause is going to be found within the formal cause, right? The final cause is going to be found within the, the purpose, right? Of the thing is going to be found within its very nature, right? Now, this is going to tie right into, um, his ethical theory here, right? Aristotelian, uh, his ethical theory, um, let me get this right. Oh, that's not what I want. I want this. Yeah. So his ethical theory, and I'm not necessarily going to go into it, virtue theory so much as I am. Just, I want to explain natural law. Um, and if you've had uh, um, which courses that I think philosophy of religion, we may discuss this. I know I talk about it in my ethics course. Um, but anyway, natural law is going to be uh, virtue theory is going to be based on that, but natural law is going to be the core of an Aristotelian ethic, meaning that if you, when we talk about natural law, we're not talking about whatever happens in nature, right? This is one of the biggest misunderstandings um, as it pertains to uh, when people try to talk about natural law. They're like, so they're like, oh, so if it happens in nature, if it's natural, then that makes it right or wrong. No, that's, that can be, there couldn't be a further misunderstanding. Um, if someone thinks that's what natural law is, natural law is talking about the nature or the essence of something, right? And so what is the nature of the essence of something? This is, we're going to see, it's all going to tie together right here. The nature or essence of anything is its formal cause, right? The, the idea, the blueprint of the thing in and of itself. So let's take you and I, for example, humans, um, the nature or essence of you or I is humanness, right? That's what we are, our nature is our formal cause, right? The formal cause of you or I is humanness, 
right? This is our nature, our essence. Now, I'm not going to go super deep into this because you're going to get this in much more depth in, in, in the, uh, my ethics course where I talk about this natural law ethic. But essentially, the point is just simply that if we know something, what something is, and again, here, I'm going to flash this out. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. If you know what something is, how do you know what something is? Well, when you know what something is, you've understood the formal cause of the thing. So if I know what a human is, right? If I know what a knife is, let's just use a knife, for example. I'll pull out a little pocket knife here, right? If I know what this pocket knife is, good night. If I know what this pocket knife is, then that means that I know what it's for, that I know its purpose, right? The final cause. And if I know what it is, then I necessarily know if I know what it is, then it, it follows, right, in Aristotelian logic that I've abstracted its nature or essence, meaning that I also know what it's for, right? So I, I don't have to have a philosophy degree to tell you if this is a good knife or a bad knife. Why? Why? Because if I know that it's a knife, I know its nature or essence, knifeness, right, whatever, then I then I can also know if it if it performs in accordance with what it is. Let me sum it up in one sentence. If I know what it is, I know what it's supposed to do. Let me say that again. If I know what it is, then I know what it's for. If I know what it's, if I know what it is, then I know its purpose, right? So if I know what a knife is, I know what makes a good knife or a bad knife. Namely, if it can't cut, if it can't perform its purpose, then it's not a good one. If it can, then it is, then it's a good one, right? So now, how does this apply to ethics? Let's just talk, think, talk about humans for a second. If I know what humans are, right, let's just take the digestive system for a specific example. If I know what a human is, humanness, and I know that what, a, what the, the digestive system is for, if I know what the digestive, digestive system is, I know what it's for, namely to extract nutrients and provide nourishment for the body, right? Well, then when I know what the digestive system is, and I know what it's for, and then I become a bulimic, right, I'm, I'm eating food and, and vomiting it up and all that, then I'm breaking the very purpose for what it's for. And if I'm breaking the purpose of what it's for, then it's, then it's wrong. It's immoral, right? Now, notice how this is not anyone's opinion, right? So this is an objective uh, uh, ethic. It's an objective, or we could even say loosely, not the same, not, not, not concretely, but loosely, an absolute type ethic as well. It's an objective. It's definitely an objective, objective moral values and duties right here, right? Like it's no one's opinion that digestive systems are for extracting nutrients and, and nourishing the body. And if I break the purpose of, of that by throwing up or whatever, whatever I'm doing, right, then I'm not allowing, because of what the digestive system is, I'm not allowing it to fulfill its purpose. And so it's therefore immoral, right? So again, this is going to apply to any sort of uh, human uh, being in that regard. If we can figure out what things are for in regard to our humanness, then we know what we ought to be doing in that sense. Um, now, one of the big objections is going to, is going to come from David Hume later, the is all, uh, the natural, what's called the naturalistic fallacy. Um, you can't derive an alt from an is, right? You can't, just because something is doesn't mean you ought to do that, that right? That's the naturalistic fallacy. And that's made its way into very popular um, apologetic type arguments now, right? That, 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 that most apologists, current and contemporary apologists, have embraced this naturalistic fallacy and say, yeah, that's right. You can't derive an alt from an is. Now, the old school Aristotelian or the classical philosopher there is going to want to say, well, wait a minute. You know, it's kind of like saying that um, a guy standing there with a bunch of thumbtacks and he's saying, like, you can't tell me just because these are thumbtacks that I can't eat them. And the old school philosopher is going to say, no, I can tell you that you can't eat them because they're thumbtacks, right? Because I know what you are. I know what your digestive system is. So you can eat them if you want, but don't be surprised when you destroy the thing in the process. Um, I, you know. It's a naturalistic fallacy to say that I can't eat these thumbtacks uh, just because they are thumbtacks, right? So that's the that's the uh, a super quick kind of uh, humorous example of, of of why the classical philosophers are going to say the naturalistic fallacy just doesn't work there. Um, it just comes across as absurd to say you can't eat thumbtacks just because they are thumbtacks, right? But anyway, I know a lot of you, unless you're an apologetics junkie, that may not you may not understand at this point. It's okay, you can forget that if you need to. The point just simply is that Aristotle is going to base his ethic on what something is. 
right? And when we say natural law, again, nature or essence, the whatness, what it is. What something is is going to determine what's good or bad for that thing. What determines if something's good or bad is based on what it is, right? If you know what it is, then you know what makes it what makes something good or bad for it. Again, if I pull, hold up the pocket knife, um, it's a good knife or a bad knife according to if it performs to the function or the purpose of what a knife is is the nature, natural law, the nature or the essence of the thing in question, right? Now, virtue theory, not even really going to go into this here, um, but this is also going to be his contribution to ethical uh, uh, ethical thought, right? Philosophy of ethics there is, is going to be virtue theory. So he's going to say that uh, based off the, uh, the nature or essence of a human being, let's again, let's go to the digestive system, that we know what a digestive system is, right? And we virtue would be the everyone is called to be virtuous. You're supposed to be exercise virtue. So you've got virtue and vice, right? Virtue is the good thing you ought to do, and vice is obviously the bad, right? Now, how do you determine virtue? He'd say, all right, well, we know what the digestive system is, right? So we know that it's not to be gluttonous, right? You can't be a glutton. And yet at the same time, you can't starve to death, right? Neither one of those allow the digestive system to do what it's supposed to do and, and function at, 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 its, at its highest uh, order of capacity. So this, key, again, key, beep, 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 beep. Right, this, remember this, Aristotle introduces the golden mean, right? The golden middle ground there, meaning that being, gluttony is wrong, starving to death is wrong. So eating what you're required to eat for proper function is the right. Now he's going to, that's, that's the virtue, right? That's this, this perfect golden middle ground there. Now he's also going to say, this is in regard to, uh, again, not virtually everything, almost everything. This is what's going to produce the virtuous man, right? The virtuous woman, the virtuous human is fulfilling these virtues. So again, in regards to, uh, you know, bravery and cowardice, right? What's the perfect golden mean there? What, 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 what makes something brave? Well, rashness or foolhardiness, you know, jumping off a cliff, uh, a 90 foot cliff, just because you can, Aristotle would say that's not brave, right? That's just foolhardy. This is silly. There's no need for you to jump off a 90 cliff, foot cliff. That's just silliness. Um, on the other hand, if there's a child drowning and you need to jump off the 90 foot cliff and you don't, you'd say that's a coward. So the golden mean is bravery, right? You don't just do something rat rashly. You know, you don't hold my, watch this, hold my beer, watch this, right? that's just rash behavior. That's not brave. And yet at the same time, cowardice is just as bad. So the golden mean is bravery, right? Not rashness or foolhardiness um, and not cowardice, right? But the golden mean is bravery. So this is virtually how he's going to uh, apply this to um, any and all ethical considerations, right? Which is going to, again, be based off what something is, right? How do you know what something is? Natural law. You abstract the nature, the essence, the formal cause of things. Now, I'm not going to go into this very much because, again, I'm, you, you'll get this very, you'll get this heavily in, in philosophy religion class. Um, but it's essentially, uh, Aristotle is very well known for his argument for God called the unmoved move, unmoved mover. Now, I'll just explain that briefly here. I won't even go into the actual argument, just but just so you have a familiarity with this, is that when Aristotle is saying unmoved mover, he's not necessarily saying that unmoved this thing, right? I'm moving. Unmoved mover in this in this context is really talking about change. So if there's any sort of change at all, right? Change in temperature, change in location, of course, uh, locomotion, right? Moving in that sense also uh, applies here, but it's not just confined to that type of movement. So again, it's talking about change in temperature. It's talking about change in color. It's talking about uh, change from one thought to another thought. Any change at all, right? A mud puddle getting bigger to smaller, right? Evaporation, any sort of change um, any sort of change at all, a flag that's flapping in the wind to not flapping in the wind or vice versa uh, from not flapping to flapping, right? Any sort of change at all, any sort of thing going from a potential state, right, um, to an actual state. Aristotle is going to argue that here's the argument roughly that anything that's in a potential state, right, it, it, meaning that it could be some other, some other way, has to have something that's already in an actual state to move it to an actual state, like flags don't start flapping themselves. They have to have something like wind, but wind doesn't start moving itself, right? And by, on and on and on and on ad infinitum, something that's already actual has to be getting the process going. Otherwise, you're going to get into an infinite regress of causes, 
right? You'll never have anything that actualizes things because every time you say this actualizes this, well, then you're just going to have to go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Now, how is this different than the, than the Kalam cosmological argument? Well, because Aristotle would say that the Kalam cosmological argument you can have a, a domino that knocks over another domino, 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 but you can't have something that's moving something here and now without having something that's moving that thing here and now without having something that's moving that thing here and now. Right. So there has to be something right now that exists. That's purely 100% actualized um, with zero potential. And when I say zero potential in our culture, we think of zero potential as a bad thing. No, in Aristotle's view, potential means that you're not perfect because you could you could be this or you could be that or you could do this or you could do that but something that's 100 percent actual completely actualized it's actualized all potentials there is no potential for the thing because if there was potential for the thing that means that something would have to move it right change it from that potential state to this potential state so this is how he would get to the perfect one you know literally the perfect absolute purely actualized limitless infinite God, right, is, is this argument. Now, again, you can get that in much more detail in the philosophy of religion course where I talk about that um, in much more detail. Uh, but it has to do with the difference between form and matter, um, uh, act and potency, all these, again, these, these Aristotelian metaphysical categories. Um, but there you go. So there's, there's a lot in there. I know you can listen to this two or three times if you need to. Um, but this is Aristotle's. Uh, some of his big contributions to philosophy. There's a couple more, but these are the big ones, right? Um, and I've just tried to highlight these for you. Um, hopefully we can pull even more out of our text um, as we go through our text and whatnot. Um, however, I hope this gives you a lot to think about. Uh, hopefully it introduces you and makes you inter uh, introduce to Aristotle and gets you interested in Aristotle. However, having said that, Let's do it again if you need to, and we'll continue in our history of philosophy and some of these ideas. And now already, let me just go and say this. You can see how some of them are related, right? You see how pl uh, Platonic thought, or Aristotelian thought is related to Platonic thought, but slightly different. See, so we're already seeing reactions to and nuanced views on previous philosophies and whatnot. All right, so there you go.